Good morning all. Like fluttering leaves and dew drops in springtime, webinars are clearly covering upon us. This is Postgraduate Department of English, Government College for Women, Tiruvannadapuram, presenting lecture number three in the series. Literary text reborn, recognizing the gentle art of translation. This will be a journey through the works of Ms. Prema Jayakumar, author, translator, and columnist. Let me introduce myself. I am Hiba Amin, student of final year MA English Language and Literature. Without much verbosity, let's get the ball rolling. I call upon our HOD, Mr. Ajit Kumar Jayan, for the welcome speech. Sir. And most beloved principal, Dr. Aryan Dalshan K, our resource person for the lecture, Ms. Prema Jayagumar, dear coordinator, Dr. Sarida Ji, my dear colleagues, teachers from other departments, other colleges my dear students and all participants. A happy good morning to all. Whenever I think about translation or uh, translators, I often wonder whether there is anything like a translator's curse. For it is believed that it is very difficult to translate a work of art without losing its artistic excellence, its literary brilliance. Every translator is expected to overcome this, this hurdle, this, this challenge, to translate without losing the artistic excellence of the original text. And of course, this makes their work multi-dimensional. This makes their work very difficult. Not a mere knowledge of uh, two languages will contribute to translation. Here one takes a book from a particular language, a particular social structure, a particular um, cultural realm and place it uh, in an entirely different one where its acceptability is in the hands of the you know, translators. Even when we boast of that human emotions are universal, there are so many other things that are not at all universal and it makes Really, it makes the work of uh, translation a very difficult one. Um, but when we go through our title, it is given that the gentle art of uh, translation, the gentle art of translation. I, and I, I wonder how it can be a gentle because uh, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of, there are a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges that a, a translator may face. And uh, perhaps after this lecture, uh, we shall get a, a, a very good insight uh, into the various aspects of translation. Uh, I do not uh, elaborate. Let me be precise with my task. First of all, I welcome our most respected, most beloved uh, principal, Dr. Aravinda Krishnan K who has wholeheartedly agreed to inaugurate this session and uh, on behalf of the Department of English and uh, all who have logged in, I extend a warm welcome to our most beloved principal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, um, 
of course the department is lucky enough or uh, in a sense the department is blessed to have such a very established uh, translator and author uh, uh, when we approached um, uh, prema ajay kumar to deliver uh, a, a deliver an online lecture uh, she has whole heartedly accepted our invita invitation and uh, uh, i also extend our indebtedness to her uh, on behalf of all who uh, present here and uh, uh, on behalf of the department of english i extend a warm welcome to the resource person ms prema jayakumar i extend a warm welcome to our staff coordinator dr uh, sajida g uh, who has been uh, uh, whose uh, idea uh, has uh, now worked out and uh, the department is sincerely thankful to her for arranging such a uh, lecture uh, on behalf of all who uh, present here i extend a warm welcome to our uh, staff coordinator dr sarida ji thank you so much sir i also welcome all uh, my uh, colleagues uh, teachers from other departments my students all the participants uh, all who have logged in uh, i welcome everyone to this session thank you Thank you, sir. Next, I would like to invite our respected principal, Dr. Arvind Krishnan, sir, for the inaugural address, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today is the most happiest day as far as the English department is concerned for organizing such a webinar in a. in a very lucid manner i take this uh, opportunity to welcome you all and i may extend a happy and warm good morning to one and all who have taken a way to participate in this program through the platform i think the resource person of today is dr prema jay kumar a composite literary criticist or a translator who has taken much pains to translate ever so many novels from malayalam to english as far as my knowledge is concerned this program is taken over by the department of english under the auspicious guidance of uh, dr sarita and the much pain taken over by the students who organized such a program in a very memorable very suitable day it is suitable manner where the translator is going to translate or to imbibe the situation in a very sweet as today within the short span of time the students who organized such a webinar by inviting such an elegant speaker of today's day i think uh, welcome you ma'am on behalf of the college thank you dr krishnan thank you thank you ma'am i take this opportunity is also to extend my warm wishes to the department of english under the guidance of uh, dr ajit who is the head of the department and all the teaching staff of the department who also gathered or participated in this program from ever so many persons from other colleges and other participants who has taken much pain to join with us in this day i wish all the very best 
and i also request the students to extravagantly utilize the resource person of today by asking or putting some questions about the contemporary issues how to write or how to translate a novel or a fiction or a drama from malayalam to english or in vice versa i am not prologuing much being an introductory speech it is best to put a comma here not to for a full stop to comma here and we will continue later after some time whenever the resource persons to delivery regarding this particular topic is over and the thank you once again thank you once again one and all to all this function thank you very much thank you sir dr sarida ji the coordinator of this lecture will now introduce ms prema j kumar to us over to you sarida ma sarita please unmute thank you hiba respected principal head of the department of english ajit sir our esteemed guest speaker ms prema jayakumar colleagues teachers friends from other colleges and dear students good morning to all of you in these difficult days of lockdown we have actually opened our doors to eminent academicians and writers to enrich and enlighten us by sharing their experiences thoughts and uh, knowledge with us it is as part of this endeavor that we have with us a very special person uh, she has she's a well known name in the field of uh, uh, not just um, english literature but in malayalam literature as well uh, she is ms prema jayakumar like an alchemist who magically transforms other metals to gold she has rendered several books malayalam books into english taking malayalam literature beyond linguistic spaces and boundaries the body of her writing is exhaustive i'll mention just a few of them so as to give you a glimpse into the contribution she has made to literature by not just translating but also brilliantly recreating the spirit and essence of the original works in the english language her major works include uh, translations of modern bakunyotens ashwatthama malayattu ramakrishnan's yakshi malayattu ramakrishnan's mridiyude um, kavadam which was uh, translated into english as doorways to death Seidu's Pandava Buram, the Jewel of the Snake by M. T. Vasudevan Nair, the Trial of the Mahatma by again by Madam Bukunyotan, Ramaraja Bahadur by C. V. Raman Pillai, Devathinte Vigridhar translated as God's Mischief uh, by M. Mugundan. Uh, in fact, in addition to this, she has also translated several short stories. poems articles reviews she also writes in periodicals she's done a retellings of the epics ramayana and the mahabharata mahabharata uh, shakuntala krishna and the story of karna she also has to her credit a history book titled karna remenonum east india company written in malayalam and uh, and published by madhubhumi printing and publishing company she had been doing a regular weekly review of uh, book review of english books for india vision a uh, television channel in, in in kerala for about a year uh, she has also written uh, she used to write literary uh, column for uh, the new indian express on contemporary malayalam writing uh, she had been uh, uh, writing that column for about a year and a half uh, i think we are running out of time but i really must share this bit 
bit of good news with you. Uh, the bells are ringing in Haridwar. Ms. Prema Jayakumar's a translation of M. Mugundin's work, Haridwaral Manimurangunnu, has been shortlisted for the PFC VOW Books Award in the category Translation from Regional Languages into English. Uh, VOW or Valley of Words is one of India's leading literature and arts festival of India. It aims at bringing together the best writers, critics, listeners from the worlds of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry in a, in a three day literature and arts festival in the town of Dehradun. So, here is wishing you, ma'am, all the best for the award. I think now I should step aside and allow Prema, ma'am, to take us with her through her literary journey. Over to you, Hiba. Thank you, Sarada, ma'am. Here is the much awaited part of the session. I invite most cordially Ms. Prema J. Guma for sharing her ideas, thoughts, and experiences with us. But before that, I request all the participants to mute their microphones. If the participants have any questions or doubts to ask, you may post it on the chat box. After this talk, we will have a brief interactive session. So here we go. Prema ma'am, the virtual floor is all yours. Ma'am, please. Thank you. Thank you, Hilpa. Uh, after Sarita's introduction, uh, all of you are going to be disappointed. <laughs> she gave such a... Anyway, I'll try my best. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, though I would have preferred to be there physically as well. It is difficult to... It is a stimulus to the brain to be in the presence of bright young people. One tends to ossify sitting at home and working alone. Thanks are due to Dr. Arvind Krishna, Principal, Mr. Ajit Kumar, Head of the Department of English, and Dr. Sarita for not just inviting me to this uh, to be part of the series of lectures, but also for inviting, for taking the risk of inviting a non-academic who might say anything. <laughs> I'm not used to the discipline of academia. So thank you all and I'll thank you students for coming to listen to me uh, speak about the text being reborn in the gentle art of translation. I know a lot of you have a paper on translation, right? But uh, let me reiterate that I'm not an academician and do not know any theory of translation. I'm a practitioner who enjoys what I do. And I'm proud of write the writing in my language and feel that it deserves to be read and heard beyond the boundaries of the small space where it is spoken and understood, which is why I translate, one of the reasons. Which brings us to the question, why does anyone translate? Of course, I'm talking about the translation of creative writing, not about you know scientific texts and stuff. One translates to convey not just a work of fiction or poetry, one translates a way of life as well, because otherwise there's no point in doing it. Unless what you have translated is something that is different from the general run of English writing, there is no point in translating. One reads translations to get, uh, to get something that is not available in English, something that the English writing published does not give you. It is this cultural element that makes us read these translations, though we are sure from our experience with any two languages that we know, that we can read in, that a lot of the original has been lost in the process. I'm talking of someone whose reading is mostly English, I mean, when I'm talking. Uh, one reads the Russians and the Latin Americans and the French in English because we cannot read them in the original. And we know we will uh, get something different, a flavor, an excitement that is different from English writing. Uh, into Malayalam, we have always had uh, translations from many languages, Indian and those of, uh, uh, outside India. When my generation was growing up, the Madhubhumi Weekly, which was uh, part of our daily, uh, you know, weekly reading, serialized two novels regularly. One would be from Malayalam and the other would be from 
in other another language indian or english i read a number of the greats of bengali hindi oriya marathi tamil through these translations i read tamasi and ashapurna devi by the tamasi by jarasand and ashapurna devi's novel shankar's novels so on. in fact i even read dracula in malayalam before i met it in english uh and a scary experience it was too the editor would you know edit it so that one ended up looking out with jonathan and seeing uh, uh drag the count dracula climb down the you know crawl down the outside wall of the castle and then one waits with bated breath for treats uh, installment so that one knows what happened where he's going and it, it was scary but it was great reading so far the reader what about the translator a couplet from the vedas says the gods have created all these forms we have to give them names according to professor vishnarayan and amburi this is more or less what a translator does the translator takes up an idea created by someone and tries to name these ideas in the language she writes in this has to be done as far as possible without loss of meaning or beauty at all order what are the requirements what are the qualifications of a translator obviously a good knowledge of two languages an awareness of the milieu of the translated text this is very important see you may know the language you can find word meanings in the dictionary but you need to know what is meant when two people say something when something is described uh you know you must know what it is about your knowledge of the language into which you are translating needs to be even better you see you can write your own thoughts with a limited vocabulary i i told you i've even written a malayalam book I, and i think it's readable malayalam no mistakes but to express someone else's thoughts well you need a much more much larger vocabulary it is because i realize this that i don't translate into malayalam my vocabulary in malayalam is very limited it suffices for my needs but not for translations mostly acquired from letters home i can read and understand any difficult text in malayalam as i have proven by taking on c v raman pillai uh, his language is impossible <laughs> mostly but still i have tried I took it on because I was bullied into it by Doctor Ayeva Panikya, but he assured me that a success rate of 25% would suffice, and I think I have achieved that. And how does one set about doing it? One reads, one needs to read the original again and again, over and over, till all the ambiguities are resolved, and one has a clear idea what the not just what the author said, but what the author. meant the statement seems very obvious i mean obviously one needs to know what the author said or meant but it has to be repeated because one careless reading can mean a complete subversion of the text let me give you a small example i'm being mean rude but still just to let you all know uh, see a poet had written a line unmadiyaya rajakumaran and the translator made it the mad rajput rajaputra uh, unmadi aya rajaputra instead the translator had read it as rajput and he had translated it as the mad Ra rajput what had been meant from the actual words and the context was that most famous of mad princes prince hamlet of denmark now let's go i mean obviously now the qualification of uh, trans uh, qualification one needs to be a translator we sort of gone through it now how should a translation read my in my you know whether it should be faithful to the original text whether the readability is more important than the accuracy uh for me readability wins always um as far as uh, possible it should read like an original work in english and i i will keep to english it's easier 
it should follow the sentence structure and it's very important you see sentence structures are very different in different languages and english and malayalam the difference is really big because uh, english is a non inflected language and malayalam has inflections like you can say krishna ne raman kandu raman krishna ne kandu raman krishna ne kodutu krishna ne raman kodutu and you know the, there's no mis there won't be a mistake about uh, what the uh, author or the speaker meant but uh, you do the same thing with english rama gave krishna krishna gave rama mean opposites so similarly that uh, sentence structure should follow the language that uh, you're reading in the idioms the usages uh, the usages of the language it is read in see some things don't mean the same thing uh, in both languages and when there are ambiguities when uh, how do i try to correct myself when there is a problem i go by the ear that is i read out the passage that is giving me trouble that sounds awkward and let my ears tell me what to change i, I find it works most of the time anyone who reads has this uh, ear it's like a musician can feel the uh, you know shruti if it's not correct you can similarly anyone who reads regularly does have this ear for mistakes awkwardness so we've come to the quali qualifications of a translator what a translation should uh, read like and now let's go to the fact that i translate from malayalam to english perhaps uh, and there hasn't there hadn't been much now there's plenty perhaps it was the difficulty of conveying the beauty of the work in a language that is not one's own and that is very alien to the original that uh, prevented outward flow of malayalam writing hardly anything got translated in earlier i like i told you we got a lot of inward translations right from the beginning in fact we've had uh, a lame israb and uh, you know all the tolstoy and even othello um, years back in the 1930s i think and sanjay and translated it into malayalam um but uh, with the exception of chemin indulekha and uh, a bit of bashir not nothing much had got translated into english when i started translating incidentally one of the pioneers was my father uh, bk men who had translated uh, c v raman pillar's mahatanda varma in um, the 1930s but no he was not the inspiration behind my taking up translation see i hardly i was hardly aware of it till i took it up again and i read the malayalam of course but i hadn't really read the english for years um as with most happenings in life it was pure serendipity i started translating because i got involved in a text you know that reading itself is an act of possession in comprehending any text we feel we own it haven't you felt it when you quote a line of poetry bit of a uh, conversation it is a feeling of real ownership when you are young and you hear akhmatova say i did not sleep last night you must have dreamt of me you wonder who dreamt so that your sleep was disturbed or when the young soldier returning to war from the returning to the war front tells his beloved he's on a ship and he says uh, he's uh, really having a tough time choosing between a seasick body and a you sick mind see you own those things they get into your experience and they become something different to take a very simple example you've seen those t-shirts which say poland ne kurichu raksharam mindaruda you know from the movie sandesham so that is also be uh, taken up by you taken up by the person who wears it so we as readers feel that the text that we hold uh we like the text that we really like hold our reflection and so each text that we own like this becomes a projection of our own experience the shadow of not just the author but the shadow of who we are 
each individual's experience colors the text even as we read it translation i feel is the ultimate act of comprehension see the poem you read is not the poem the po uh, the poem that i have read so the translation uh, comes from the poem i read a translation to be successful has to be different from the original okay it should not uh, change the meaning and all that but uh, it will be different it has to be different because it is from someone who has read the original digested it divested it of its ambiguity and then interpreted so the translator the translation necessarily an act of creation okay perhaps in some ways an act of betrayal translators have been called traitors uh, how does a translator choose a text to be translated it might be the story it might be one or more characters it might be the background of the story it should be something i would want to read even if it is in another if it is from another language and has the disadvantages associated with that with that change over going by my own experience i chose to translate the first work because i liked it uh, it was uh, ashutthama by madanga kunyudan and the magnet for me in that book was not the story the story was the usual angst of a young man and you know a lot of uh, disenchantment had set in in those years but uh, the magnet for me was the character of vitichiri who was not a common character i found this woman whose eyes were bigger than her face fascinating i talked of the background the characters especially this character to my friends who could not read the original and a few of them said wish we could read it i had some time on hand and translated it once again it got published by accident a friend who had a copy of the typescript even the type script was an you know was really an accident because my handwriting is unreadable there were no computers of course um he had it with him and next door to him lived the editor of vikas she picked it up and took it to her office and that was that a question that some of you might feel like asking a question that i am often faced with is who do i translate for this question needs to be answered before the actual work of translation begins if the reader can be presumed to be an indian a lot of cultural constructs are similar and don't need explanation the distant note of a flute and the iridescence of a peacock feather means the same thing across india you don't need to explain them but to a foreign reader these are not quite so self explanatory and yet there is a caveat here also such images and stories from the puranas or folklore may be understood across the country but not local customs and mores uh we often do not know the cultural peculiarities of commun communities who live just across the border from us Uh, let me give you an example it's from ordinary life and not from translation uh, dates back to my college days i lived in a hostel when i was doing my degree the hostel was in bangalore we had people from kerala karnataka um, Ta tamil nadu and uh, from uh, from i think andhra then so i mean a small hostel but all of us were from different backgrounds it was a government college uh one of our hostel mates had lovely stuff she had lovely clothes and she would have perfumes perfumed so all of which were not really within the reach of the rest of us of course we were jealous or rather envious so we asked her she would say they were gifts from her uncle now we were quite uh, you know we were struck down we too had uncles and none of them gave us such gifts it was later that we realized that in her community the youngest brother of the mother married the eldest daughter so it was from her fiance that she was getting all these things so 
I mean, like, uh, our uncles were completely blameless. Something like the Murapenna and the Naya community. When one of M.T. Vazevan Naya's characters calls her aunt, Etandama, she is addressing not just her aunt, but her future mother-in-law as well. So much for the Deshi readers. Uh, there is another section, and uh, it's not a very small section of the readership. I think it's fairly large. It consists of Keralites, the section, uh, especially those of the younger generation um, who can read Malayalam, who can follow, who can speak Malayalam, but prefer to read books in English because it's more of a commitment. It's a larger commitment. This must be true. I think this is a large section. Or why would translations of Malayalam books sell in Kerala? Um, but these readers too, uh, you can't take them for granted. They are not fam that familiar. Quite a few, few of them have lived outside Kerala with very many of the cultural nuances of life in Kerala. For that matter, I think there is now another section, the urban Malayali, who does, doesn't really know much about life in villages or anything. I've done, uh, it's with all these readers in my mind, you including the foreigner that I write. I've done quite a few translations over the years. I've been at it for quite some time. Novels, short stories, poems. Funnily enough, a book that was very easy to translate. I mean, I'm just talking of the difficulty of this cultural uh, baggage. Because the author, I think, was thinking in English, created a lot of trouble with the title. I'm speaking of Malayatu Ramakrishnan's Yakshi. Actually, the text flowed, you know, when I tried to do it in English, it just flowed. Um, the editor of Penguin wanted me to use the term vampire for Yakshi. Obviously, she looked up the dictionary or Asaman, and it is the vampire. But the Western vampire and the Indian yakshi, and especially the Malayali yakshi, are very different from each other. Of course, they share one thing. They like drinking blood, the human blood, preferably that of young men. But the yakshi in a number of uh, Kerala myths is beautiful. She's an accomplished person. She's also able to overcome her cruelty and even become a wife and a surrogate mother. And the character in uh, this novel is something like that. She becomes a wife. She's very supportive. She, in uh, you know, when he's not uh, paranoid about her being the vampire, he sees her as a very loving wife. Um, so we kept the title Yakshi and use the word vampire here and there. And uh, it traveled well into another culture and another language. Because uh, if BBC Radio picks it up, if a foreign reader at BBC Radio picks it up for reading on their off-the-shelf program, obviously communicated there also. Uh, another title I had a lot of problem with. I mean, most titles give you problems unless they are place names or you know, something simple like that. Because uh, once again, like poetry, you're condensing a lot into one word or a phrase. Uh, another one that I had a lot of problem with, I have had problems with others also, but this was very difficult. We had to change the whole thing. For Setu's Niyogam. Now, Niyogam is simple. I know the word translation. It means uh, your mission, something you're entrusted with by whatever. Your people, uh, you know, you, niyogi kya you have that phrase. But in this particular book, it was a technical term. There is a technical meaning for this word, where, like uh, it, it goes to Mahabharata or something. Um, uh, I mean, it goes to Mahabharata also, like when Vyasa sleeps with the widows of his brother for the sake of continuation of the line. I mean, it is a purely, uh, it's a purely ritualistic sort of thing. It's called Niyoga. Like he doesn't sleep with them because he wants to sleep with them. He does it so that the line continues. And that is how Vijitra Vidya and Chitrangata are born. 
no, sorry, Pandu and Dhritarashtra are born and Vidura. So, I mean, we didn't know what to do with it. You, possibly, you can't possibly explain this whole thing in a title. Finally, we just gave up on this the yoga uh, in the thing and called it the wind from the hills. The wind from the hills again was a character who spreads candle. So that worked. Um, you see, it is this very difference. The fact that uh, you are coming across things which you would not know in English that makes a poem or a book or a novel worth translating. A story that could be written in any language um, or place in society is hardly worth the trouble of translating. That, of course, is a personal opinion. Um, I have enjoyed the work I have done, not been particularly bothered about the lack of recognition that a translator used to get. Things have improved considerably from the time when I started writing. Somehow the impression was that those who could would write, and those who could not would translate. Uh, it was used to be very irritating to be asked by every second person when I would stop translating and would tell, start writing my own work, my own book. As if a secondary book from me could replace the excellent work that I had just finished translating. See, if I have anything to say, I would write. But if I don't, I might as well convey what someone else has to say, something that's good. Uh, but then, of course, matters have improved like, a lot. Retna Books have uh, published three of my translations was set up just for that. And that's a fantastic thing, to publish translations from Indian languages. The booker is being given to a translated work. But even now, there are publishers who would rather keep the existence of the translator a secret. They're reluctant to have your name on the cover page and blame it on the general practice. Uh, I read an article uh, by Jenny Erdal where she says she had to uh, evaluate 90 translations. She had to read and evaluate it as part of a, an award committee. I quote her. Even today, the name of the translator can often be hidden among the preliminary pages, a tiny intimation tucked away alongside the printer and the binder. While every translator is accredited somewhere, the names can still be hard to find. She goes on to say that she found the names of only two translators out of the 90 on the title page. Of course, sometimes the omission might be because your life is at risk, as in the recent case. Matters are improving, and I really wish I was at the beginning of my active trans activities in translation rather than at the fag end. There is so much more opportunity to get the, your work published. And yet, a number of us persisted, in spite of all these disadvantages, and managed to get uh, our small voices heard. What made us do that? Perhaps the very fact that it was difficult. I mean, you you want to climb the Everest because it's there. Just as you don't, just as you despair when a word or a sentence defeats all your attempts to put it into English. Just think of something as simple as bhasma. Uh, once in a while, you manage to convey the exact meaning in an alien language, maybe by altering the actual sentence but by coining a word, and it's a wonderful feeling. Uh, I don't know if you'll have heard of the, I mean, like if you're aware of that Hindu Papa Karani in Darnu being the Ana, Kuryana being translated as uh, an elephant ant. The actual creature is an ant lion, but would not suit the story. So Professor Asher Kaur changed the name into elephant ant. I tried something of the of, uh, of a similar kind in one of my uh, doorways today. See, there's a bird called the Kalangori. I don't know if you all have heard it. Hopefully, to random people would have, you still have trees. It hoots at night and is supposed to presage a death in the house. I searched the dictionaries and found that it was a kind of jay. No, you can't make a reader afraid of a J. 
<laughs> so uh, combining the fact that it was a night bird and its food, food foretold a death. I called it a death owl. Hopefully, uh, I, I was thrilled with my choice of word, but hopefully people got that feeling of fear, of elomen from the word. I mean, when a death owl foods, you would be a little scared, wouldn't you? Another instance uh, I can quote is a line in a poem. It's within quotes, the line. It's not part of the poem. It says, Pudhiya Agasham, Pudhiya Fumi. Now, it's easily translated. A new sky, a new um, earth. But the phrase comes with a lot of cultural baggage in Kerala. It was this context that was being evoked in the poem. You see, there was a time when the left movement was supposed to save the world. There were artists taking up uh, the propagation of those ideas. And KPEC was one of those uh, um, institutions which tried to do that. There was a play by Topil Basi, which is called Pudhiya Agash and Pudhiya Kuni. So what the author writing, the poet writing in um, in the 90s, but no, latest in the 21st century was talking of was the feeling of betrayal that a lot of those artists felt when uh, this ideology did not solve all the problems of the world. It did not make everyone, you know, um, rich or even comfortably off. So there is that sense of betrayal, which uh, just translating the words would not have given. So I chose to translate it uh, as, Oh, brave new world, Miranda's words from the Tempest. Because there again, Miranda is seeing something that's not true. She says, oh, brave new world that has such creatures in it. She's very impressed with the sight she's seeing. But uh, that is actually a false sight. She has, uh, she is seeing the people who try, she's seeing traitors, people who try to kill her father and herself. And uh, a further, this thing, a further mean, uh, layer of meaning was added by Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, where uh, you know, the promise that science will solve the problems of the world, that science will make this world a much better place, was again betrayed. It didn't work out. So uh, I don't know if everyone caught those uh, nuances, the layers, but then uh, original poem also, I don't know if everyone caught Pudhiya Agash and Pudhiya Bhumi as the poet intended it. But uh, it is not really an essential. It just gives you a feeling of uh, pleasure that you're able to uh, <laughs> add a layer of meaning, similar to what the poet intended. Uh, and an anecdote might explain better. I think it was in ground in the ground beneath her feet that Rushdi has a studio and photography uh, material shop called Nebuchadnezzar. I know the name, I knew the name of the king, but hadn't connected. Henry Cartier Brezin had a store in New York called the Magnum, the photographer, the famous photographer. Rushdie had played a pun on that. A Magnum is also champagne, 1.5 liters of uh, a bottle containing 1.5 liters of champagne. A Nebuchadnezzar holds 15 liters of champagne. Nebuchadnezzar is also a bottle of champagne and contains 15 liters. So the pun shows that this particular uh, studio was 10 times as big as Katya Presence. Just a joke, but fun when you get to know of it. It doesn't matter if you didn't. I mean, like you don't lose anything. Um, I don't know if I have time. I, do, I don't think I have much time. But uh, let me just uh, get to one small thing. Which kind of text, what kind of text is most difficult to translate? Obviously, poetry is more difficult than prose because language is compressed and there are, there are layers of meaning in each word, which uh, may not necessarily, the words are chosen for the compression. But the most difficult of all, which I haven't attempted, would be humor. Tragedies are very universal. Othello can become Kaliyatam and still remain believable. Macbeth can become Makbu and uh, seen 
seem comfortably and not seem odd. But uh, comedy and even worse, humor that arises from wordplay is almost impossible to translate. Even a master of two languages like VKM could not do a successful job of translating his own work into English. I really know of only one complete success in the translation of humor, and that is Asterix, the translation of Asterix from French. Even the names, in fact, the names more than anything else, are so beautifully translated. In fact, I myself prefer the English names to the French. The Druid is much better off with the name of Getafix rather than Panorix as in the original, don't you think? And so, so to cacophonics. Oh, I could go on. But we, since we don't have time, so we just bow our heads before Anthea Bell and pass on. Let me once again come back to the question. Why do I translate? I did tell you one of the reasons earlier. I think my language is rich and deserves to be heard by a wider audience. But it is also because I enjoy translating. I love words. I enjoy the flavor of words. So I enjoy fitting one word, balancing it with another, a sentence for another, trying to retain the weight, the color, and yes, the flavor of the words of the original in my translated version. Of course, some attempts end in dismal failures, but an honorable failure is also an acceptable result. The basic question, do we need translations flawed as they are? Just think of it in these terms. We have been told by those who can read the original texts of the Russians, the French, the Spanish, none of them read very well in translation. We know from our own experience that some of the Malayalam books that you read in translation are poor travelers. They are travesties of the original. Still, still, would you rather be with without the great books like the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Iliad, the Odyssey, all those wonderful works you've read in translation, some in English, some in Malayalam, and enjoy in spite of not knowing the language they were originally written in, I would accept the flawed versions, accept the half loaf with gratitude. And uh, I, so I keep translating, hoping that the reader who could not read the original will get some of the grace and passion of the story or the poem. And I console myself with Salman Rushdie's words. It is normally supposed that something gets lost in translation. But uh, I cling obstinately to the notion that something can also be gained. And Dr. Ayapa Panikya once said, what remains after translation is poetry. So let's hope to keep the poetry or the prose, yeah, whether it's in verse or prose in the origin of the original in translation. Okay, thank you all for putting up with a rather rambling talk on the gentle art of translation, where literary texts are reborn and lives are interpreted for the benefit of those who do not know the original. I have enjoyed being with you. Thanks once again. Thank you, Prema Ma'am, for that absolutely enlightening and eye-opening talk. If it had not been for the translators, we would never have had the chance to enjoy the beauty of much of world literature. I think we can now move on to the interactive part of the session. The participants can either ask their questions directly or post them on the chat box. Sarudaman. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box. Uh, does anybody wish to? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. The first question. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to take all the questions together or um, together? No, and... one after another. One after. Okay, okay. So I'm going to read out a question. This is from Dhanya Babu. Uh, have you at any time felt that you could improvise the content of any book? 
Uh, you mean not translate, but uh, sort of replant it? I think so. I think okay. that is what she means. I think this has been done. I don't know if you know that there was a time when uh, Sherlock Holmes has been like uh, how I've read the Hound of the Baskervilles as the uh, as Baskaravilla Satirepati. So that kind of thing I have never tried. I only translate, but it has been done. Woodhouse has been reborn as Shupu Shupu in Malayalam. I don't know of anything that went to English like that. I mean, I obviously my knowledge is not as wide. Shall I read out the next one? Yeah, please. Oh, OK. Uh, this is from Parashram and Sir. What is your take on changing sentence structure and order uh, in the TL to better capture in the te teaching of language to better capture the spirit of the second language. Am yeah, I right? it, has, it has to be done because sentence structure is very different and sometimes emphasis comes only if you the correct emphasis, the emphasis that the author intended comes only if you change the order of the sentence or, and the structure, even cut paragraphs perhaps cut sentences. I mean, Ramaraja Bahadur and all would be unreadable if I had retained the uh, original. You know, I had to cut the sentences to make any kind of sense. So that has to be done where absolutely necessary. If a big sentence helps, I mean, like if a big sentence is absolutely essential in the uh, in the verb context, you try to retain it. But some are impossible to convey in English, especially with the lack of inflection. You know, the case endings are not there. So you have to change it sometimes. Uh, I'll read out Parashram and Sir's uh, reply, reassuring to hear your answer, ma'am. Uh, next, <laughs> next question is, from Malavika Dilip, um, can you please tell uh, tell me the name of the book that you enjoyed translating the most? Uh, see, you enjoy translating various things for various reasons. Like some because you're easy, some because it was a real challenge that you broke your head on it. Some because, like, I've done Desha Tindakata. Now, I love that book. Uh, because uh, it, uh, I, a lot of the stories in it, and my mother's from Calicut, and a lot of the stories in it are things that I have heard her and her brothers talk about. There is an Altar of Sanyasi, and you know, all those stories I had heard. So the nostalgia is there. So various things, you know, I really can't pick one book and say this is the one I enjoy. I enjoy a lot of them for various reasons. So uh, difficult. <laughs> uh, next question is from Nakai uh, Kasi. This is it. Of all the books you have translated, which one was the most challenging as far as the cultural context was concerned? Um, cultural context, maybe. You know, various. Ashutama was quite difficult because uh, Kunyodan had has placed it very, very specifically in a Nambudri uh, you know, household, very old fashioned Nambudri household. And that even, and his language is very compressed. So that was very difficult. And a lot of, um, as far as language is concerned, of course, Nana CV is the most difficult. I think even people who, there's been a whole book written on his language, Pradipatram Bhashana Bhedam because it's so difficult. In fact, one of the compliments, best compliments I got was from a friend who read my translation and said she had finally understood Ramaraja Bahadur, which she had not when she read it in Malayalam. Because as I said, you know, the you cut sentences, you lose track somewhere along the way. So that was difficult in terms of language, culture. Yakshi again, as I said, the whole concept of Yakshi was difficult. People couldn't understand it. At least my editor couldn't. <laughs> so each of them, for various reasons. 
Uh, we have uh, one more question. This is again uh, from Parashraman, sir. Haven't you found Malayalam better designed for verbalizing intense emotional experiences? Didn't you find English lacking at times? No. To me, English is the language of my expression, which is why I translate into English. You can't really say that the language of uh, Shakespeare and Yeats and all of them is lacking in intense expression. No. <laughs> I really don't believe But that's that. not today's English, no? No, but even today's English, why not? And for that matter, I find today's Malayalam quite alien. I, ca I, can, I can't really enjoy some of the stuff I read. I think, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm not well up to the latest writing in English, but uh, Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath and all are very intense writers. I mean, I can really get the, uh, you know, the emotion when I read those. Some of it is really intense. In fact, uh, I my reading now in Malayalam is very limited because uh, I find some of the new writing very difficult to read. I find it bland. <laughs> some of it, not all of it. The poetry, no, but the fiction, yes. Some of it. Lena, do you have any questions? OK. Uh, another question from Sanjita. Uh, I hope you wouldn't mind if we extend this session to a few more minutes, ma'am. Uh, oh, no, we no, still no have problem. quite a few questions coming up. No problem at all. <laughs> okay. I, hope I didn't exceed my allotment. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it was sheer pleasure listening to you. In fact, uh, um, I, I don't think we had enough of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, so okay. Uh, I'll read out the next question. It is from Sanjita. Uh, uh -huh. Here is it. Uh, Ma'am, how would you translate the word Kochu Modelali in Chemmin? <laughs> Uh, maybe young sir, you do use young sir in uh, English sometimes in books, so it would be acceptable. Okay. But ev everything is not translatable, let me tell you. Um, like somebody wanted me to translate Bhārya Buddha. Now that is not there in, I mean you can't translate it into English. Because Bhārya-Vīda is not a concept that exists in English. You have your parental home, you have your own home, the wife has her parental home, but it's not your Bhārya-Vīda, that thing isn't there. So, I mean, similarly. Uh, the next question uh, from Triya Garnayar. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was refreshingly enlightening. One tends to assume at first, translation simply means replacing the words from one language to another. But knowing how much effort it takes to keep the soul of the book intact and preciously unpolluted, we are all in awe. Ma'am, I wanted to ask you, have you ever personally felt undermined or unappreciated in this vast field? And if yes, then have you ever acted against it? Beautiful question. OK. I have. Obviously, I have. But I told you, I used to find it very irritating to be asked, when are you going to write your own book? As if this was some kind of uh, you know second-rate activity that I was engaged in. Especially when you know, you've just done something good and you're feeling very satisfied with yourself. That question is really irritating. And I have reacted against it. I have protested against it. I can relate. It. Pardon? He can I relate. I can relate to that, ma'am. Yeah. And I have also uh, asked that my name. I mean, I, it's not that uh, I'm very thing about publicity, but I think the translator's name should be on the cover page. I have protested where it is not. I and mean, just as a matter of comment. But then uh, that's when I told you, I was told that was a general practice. It is not, not necessarily. Uh, so I have, I have reacted. I have found it irritating <laughs> as anyone would. It's a very Indian practice, actually. In Europe, they have no problem with the translator on the cover. 
Uh, yeah, but it's changing now, you know. I told you, Ratna, uh, uh, since, uh, I suppose since they've said, they have been set up just to publish translations, they do have the name and they do have your have you on the flap. So <laughs> they acknowledge your existence. That's all? Okay. Parisha, no, no, one more. Uh, Parisha, sir, uh, I can see that you have put, in, uh, put one more comment. Would you like to... Uh, can I put that question directly to uh, Prema ma'am or uh, do you want me to read it out? You read it out. Okay. Uh, this is again from Parasharaman sir. I'm myself trying to self-start as an English to Malayalam translator. Please give me your blessings. For all its limitations, translation is a noble pursuit. Yes, definitely a noble pursuit, and I wish you all the best in your endeavor, Mr. Parish. Parish, 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 Parish. Yeah. Can you can yeah. you take so one more all, question? Can I just ask what he's doing? He's teaching in uh, university college, professor. No, professor. no, I mean my old work. Oh, okay. No, or is it? Right. Okay, never mind. I'll let it be. No, See I'm doing one. some life writing actually. Okay. Autobiographical. Okay. But that's not a translation. You were talking of a translation? No, I'm doing it in English first because English is like my first language. Yeah. Uh, I was in a multi uh, linguistic boarding school and English was our lingua franca. Uh, but now I'm trying to do uh, not simultaneous but immediately successive version of each little in bit Malayalam. in Malayalam. Okay. Because my I did present, that for my Malayalam novel. Malayali mostly. And do we have time for two more questions? Sure. Ah, okay. This is from Salim. Uh, translation naturally happens when I read a text. I think it happens to every reader. Uh, this is not a question, but. Uh, uh, a comment. Yeah, I think it happens to it. It happens uh, naturally when you read a text. Uh, uh, it does if you like words. If, as I said, you try to balance words even in your ordinary, you know, life. Not necessarily a text, but even if you hear something, you wonder if it could have been better put that way. So, to people like that, yes, translation. And if you're fluent in two languages, yes. Just. One more question, please. Uh, what are the major? Uh, what were the major challenges you faced while translating poetry? Um, right? Poetry is definitely more difficult. As I said, it's much more compressed than prose. Uh, I will just and uh, there is this thing of. You know, uh, one of uh, N. N. Kakad's uh, poems contains a small para where he explains why it's called a letter to Mr. T. S. Eliot. He explains why it's uh, more difficult to understand, why Eliot would find him more difficult to understand. Uh, the poem says, Mr. Eliot, Tangal Kidmanasilagunundavilya, Uruguna Astiuda Karachal Tangal Kumanasilavo, Kadiuna Nadigal Lude, Amrudam Uruguna Shandi, Tangal Karyani de Ilia, Nam Tamil Arairem Yojana Andera Mundalo, Arairem Jen Mangalude Andera, Urihima Bande, Uru Pranavatin de Andera. So see, unless you know what. Pranavam means. In this, there is one word which is Ajamanam. Ajamanam is when, uh, you know, the priest takes one handful of water and sips it ritually. Now, you can't call it a sip. A sip is not that at all. So, one adds a word, calls it a ritual sip, and so on. So, obviously, poetry is more difficult because it's more compressed. I think I we had sort of. I think, uh, yeah, we've exhausted. 
It was it was great listening to you. In fact, um, after listening your uh, listening to your talk, I feel that it's it's um, unfair, not just to the translator but even to the reader to be denied information about somebody you know, without uh, who has made it possible uh, for them to read and enjoy works which probably you would never have got to read otherwise. Thanks. <laughs> on so, behalf of this you know much maligned uh, group <laughs> traitors oh. liars cheats so on so on <laughs> so i think um, that that's it mm? that's it. okay shall i heba heba over to you thank you sarada ma'am prema ma'am and the participants for the questions and answers moving on to the concluding part of the session I invite Dr. Sanjita J for the vote of thanks. Sanjita ma'am. Thank you Hipa. Uh so good afternoon everyone. We have come to the end of the third lecture. I'm sure all of you enjoyed listening to the very pleasant and enriching uh, lecture or talk by um, Ms. Prema J. Verma. Let me move on to my task. First of all, let me express our gratitude on behalf of the Department of English, the faculty, and the students. Um, uh, I thank our principal, Dr. Aravind Krishnan K, uh, for his uh, warm words of encouragement and support. Uh, let me move on uh, to uh, thanking our head of the department, um, Professor Ajit Kumar, a strong pillar of support. He always encourages us in uh, all our academic endeavors. And um, uh, Prema ma'am, uh, this was a very delightful session. We enjoyed uh, listening to you as you shared with us your personal experiences, your uh, very rich experiences of uh, being uh, a translator. Uh, about um, you, you told us how a translator should read uh, what are the problems uh, that uh, you have encountered, especially when you, um, when it comes to fidelity in translation, like when you translate idioms and usages, uh, the cultural baggage and so on, who do I translate for? Uh, and it's very evident that you have a great passion in, um, in translation. You enjoy your work and your love of language and reading is very evident. And, um, uh, you are definitely the alchemist who uh, who changes one language to another. So thank you so much, Prema Ma'am. We really enjoyed your session. Thank you very much. My pleasure to have been with you all. Uh, I also thank um, uh, Dr. Sarita Ji for taking the effort to uh, organize uh, this uh, webinar and for choosing such a relevant topic. Thank you, Sarita. She did everything single-handedly. So thank you very much. Um, a special word of thanks to Dr. Anita Isaac. Uh, she is the one um, uh, who helped uh, Sarita to, with the registration form, with the Google Forms, and so on. So thank you, Anita. Uh, thanks to uh, all my colleagues in the department, uh, teachers from other colleges, teachers from other departments, um, the students. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks to our former principal, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, who was uh, with us. Um, our former head of the department, Dr. Deepa, thank you for joining us. Thanks to all the participants, um, especially those who uh, made the session very interactive with their uh, questions. A special thanks to Ms. Hiba, our student, who has uh, completed the session excellently. So I hope I have covered almost everyone. So thank you again on behalf of the Department of English and on behalf of the coordinator. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjita ma'am. Does Sarada ma'am wish to say something? Uh, yes, Hiba. Before we wind up, I would like to inform all particip participants that you will receive your uh, certificates if you have submitted the Google form. Uh, in fact, I, uh, some of you must have already received a certificates of participation even before the webinar. And that was actually a blooper and uh, a trial that went horribly wrong. Uh, however, you will receive the real one today, hopefully by this evening. And uh, in case you don't uh, get it, uh, do please feel free to contact me. As far as uh, online platforms are concerned, I'm still learning the ropes. So thank you so much once again, uh, Prema ma'am and everybody else. 
uh, here um, for being with us uh, today. Thank you so much. Okay. Over to you, Bye. Hiba. Bye bye. Over to you, Hiba. Thanks, Hiba. <laughs> With that, we come to the end of today's session. Soon, we will be back with another fruitful session on another topic. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.